All right, I think we can kick things off. Welcome to our webinar today on, on calculating emissions from your electricity from the two location and market-based methods. I'm Nicholas Sontag, Senior Manager for Sustainability here at Sustain Life. I build a lot of the logic and, and math that goes into our emissions calculations. And today I'm joined by Jasmine Zhuang. Jasmine, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Jasmine Zhuang, Head of Product here at Sustain Life. So I work closely with the sustainability team, as well as our design and engineering team to build out our platform, including all of the features and functionality that you'll see today. Thank Great. you for coming. Just to set the stage, getting into our, our webinar, I do want to talk about what we're going to discuss today. So we're going to start off with some specific information about electricity grids and electricity markets. This is going to be tailored for the United States, but the principles are going to apply regardless of where you are in the world. And then after that, I'll, I'll hand it over to Jasmine, who's going to do a demo in our app to show you what it would look like if you were accounting for your electricity emissions in our app. I also want to clarify what electricity are we talking about today? Because there's a lot of electricity that gets used throughout your value chain. And today we're, we're talking specifically about your scope two electricity, electricity that you're purchasing or acquiring from a third party and using within your own operations. I also want to clarify that, you know, many of you may have remote workers that are using electricity in the course of their work at home, and that electricity actually falls under a different a greenhouse gas protocol accounting category that falls under employee commuting. So that's a, a different topic for, for another day. We're going to stick to electricity that you're, you're using within your operations. And I also want to add a bit of a disclaimer over the next couple slides, I'm going to go into a fair amount of detail about city generation and distribution. And all of this is to provide you with the necessary context to understand why these different methods exist. And most importantly, to help you interpret your emissions results when you calculate your emissions from electricity. I want you to remember that a, a lot of this, a lot of the accounting rules are not necessarily things you have to know, especially if you're using our app. It's something our app does entirely for you. So this is just to, to give some necessary background. So let's jump into it. Talk about U.S. electricity markets a little bit. The U.S. grid in the lower 48 is divided into 20, 20, 22 different subregions. And in the top, top right here, we can see a map of all of the different subregions. We can think of a subregion as a self-connected, continuous grid. Subregions do share electricity with one another through importing and exporting and they they do this to balance generation and supply but but i think you can consider a subregion to be the most granular discrete unit we have for grid so within a subregion electricity is indistinguishable from other electricity and for our purposes obviously there's there's a lot happening with electricity generation and and electric grids but for our purposes there's basically two classes of activities that are happening on the grid, and those would be generation and distribution. And in other contexts, we would refer to these as supply and delivery. On the generation side, you have all of the power plants or renewable generators like hydroelectric dams that are feeding electricity into the grid. And this, this blend of different generation is referred to as the grid mix. So in the lower left, we see a pie chart of the U.S. grid mix from 2021, which was about 60% fossil fuels and 20% renewables. This grid mix is dynamic. Not only does it change year to year, but it changes even minute to minute based on what resources need to be dispatched to meet the demand of the grid. This grid mix is also where we derive emission factors. So a grid mix that has a higher proportion of renewables will result in a lower emission factor. And the expectation and indeed the trend is that renewables will continue to increase their share of the grid mix and lower the emissions intensity of the grid. So that's the generation side. And then on the distribution side, we have all of the transmission lines and transformers and substations that move that electricity from generation sources to the ultimate electricity consumers. And that distribution is owned and operated by your local utility. If you're in a deregulated market, 
the utility will will only operate the distribution. If you're in a regulated market, the utility also has a monopoly on the generation. So in the lower right, we can see a map of, of the U.S. and the states in green are ones with deregulated markets. So we can see it's a large portion of the U.S. and probably the majority population-wise. This, this distinction is important because deregulated markets introduce consumer choice into where your electricity comes from. So if you're in a deregulated market, you can say, I want my electricity to be supplied by a renewable generator, and you can engage in an agreement and for that generator to supply electricity to the, to the grid equal to the amount that, that you consume. Um, this is particularly important for sort of influencing the grid and influencing the amount of, of renewables that are on the grid. So if you're in a deregulated market, you're going to have a lot more options for how you can influence your electricity emissions. We do have one challenge that is sort of highlighted by this ability to choose your supplier of electricity, which is that electricity on the grid is inherently untraceable. So electricity that is being consumed in, in one part of your subregion is indistinguishable from electricity that's being consumed in another part. If you, let's say you're located adjacent to a wind farm and that wind farm is feeding electricity in the grid, you would love to be able to say that your ele electricity is probably renewable, but there's actually no, no way to definitively claim renewableness to your electricity. And not only that, but there's not a good way to ensure that somebody else isn't claiming that their electricity is renewable because they're next to the same wind farm. And so this, this poses a problem both for making claims about your energy, but also for accounting for your emissions. And the solutions here are, the first one here is something that you're probably familiar with. You know, technically I would describe it as decoupling energy attribute claims from the energy itself. And here in North America, we know that as renewable energy certificates or RECs. In Europe, they're called guarantees of origin. Elsewhere in the world, particularly in developing countries, they're called IRECs, international RECs. And basically what's happening here is if I'm a renewable energy generator, so I operate a, a wind farm, for every megawatt hour of electricity I produce, I can sell that electricity on the wholesale market, assuming I'm in a deregulated market as a supplier. And then separately, I also generate a certificate for one megawatt hour of renewable energy. And I can sell that on the rec. So not only does this in solve the problem of traceability of electricity, because I can sell that rec with the electricity itself or, or separately, but it also uh, resolves this issue of double counting claims to renewable electricity because there's now a chain of custody for that certificate. So the recs sort of solve this problem of traceability and double counting, but we still need a, a solution for how we're going to count for emissions, how we're going to get that emissions number for my electricity. And the greenhouse gas protocol introduced a few years ago, this dual reporting approach consisting of two different methods of calculating your scope two electricity emissions. So we're not going to solve this problem by having one emissions number. We're now going to have two emissions numbers that are, are not necessarily additive. They're just different ways of looking at my electricity emissions. And these are called the location-based and market-based methods. The location-based method is the simplest. If you've done some accounting in the past, or you have some, familiar with, some, some familiarity with accounting, then you've probably done this before. It's the most straightforward. And basically, the location-based method is the emissions associated with the grid mix. Because my my real emissions are really a, a, a result of the blend of different generation that's on the grid at that particular time, regardless of my supplier or who's, who's producing energy for me. So for the location-based method, we simply, in the United States, take the emission factor for the subregion you're in and, and multiply it by your electricity consumption. The, the new method that was really introduced as a part of this dual reporting approach is the market-based method, which are the emissions associated with your energy attribute claims. So we can think of an example of I'm using a thousand kilowatt hours of electricity and my local emissions factor for my 
subgrid is 0.1, then for my location-based emissions, we would just multiply 0.1 by 1,000 to get 100 you know, kilograms of CO2. For my market-based method, if I'm buying something like Rex equal to the amount that I'm consuming, then my market-based method are actually going to be zero. And so I'll have these two numbers, and I like to think of it as the location-based method represents what your real emissions are, because your real emissions are a blend of all of the different generation on the grid. And the market-based method reflects the emissions of my decision-making or the influence I'm trying to have on the grid through my purchasing decisions. Okay, so how do I get these energy attribute claims? They sound, they sound pretty good. Well, you get them through contractual instruments. And a contractual instrument is an agreement to either purchase electricity from a supplier or purchase the underlying attribute claims. And there's kind of two categories of contractual instruments. The first category are ones where you're buying both at the same time. So I may be buying renewable electricity from a, a renewable generator within my utilities area. And at the same time, they're conveying those recs that they are producing to me. This type of contractual instrument is only available to those that are in deregulated markets because in a deregulated market, you can choose who your energy supplier is. In a regulated market, you can't. It's the utility. And then the second category we, we have here are contractual instruments where you're only purchasing that underlying energy attribute. You're not producing the energy associated with it. So I'll talk a little bit about these. In the first category, we have energy supply contracts and power purchase agreements. An energy supply contract is where you enter in an agreement with an ESCO, an energy services company, that is aggregating generation across a variety of different sources, and then packaging that into a a product that they're selling to you. Energy supply contracts are not limited to renewable energy, though they, you can buy renewable energy supply contracts, but for most of their history, they've actually been about purchasing fossil fuel-based energy. And you wouldn't do this necessarily because you want to incentivize fossil fuel electricity generation. You do this because that particular product that you're buying has a, a advantageous pricing structure generally for your business. So you know, these supply contracts can have fixed pricing, they can have variable pricing, and and generally for, for most of their history, that's why um, consumers have, have sought them out. We also have power purchase agreements in this category. So contrast this from with an energy supply contract where you're basically buying an aggregation of electricity. In a power purchase agreement, you're entering into an agreement with a specific generator that's within your utility zone. So, you know, I may be located in Albany, New York, and there may be a wind farm in Buffalo. And I, I'm going to tell them, I'm going to buy your electricity and I'm going to buy the associated recs with that electricity. And power purchase agreements are a great way for renewable generators to secure long-term revenue. In the second category here, where we're only buying the associated energy attribute claims or RECs, if we're in North America, we have unbundled RECs. So you're buying a REC and you're not buying the electricity. That's why it's called unbundled. In the former case I just described with the power purchase agreement, you'd be buying a bundled REC because you're also buying the electricity. So for unbundled RECs, you're buying from a broker who's, who's selling to you from the, the REC market. If you're in North America, again, if you're in in Europe, they're called guarantees of origin and elsewhere, and we have IREX. So if I'm buying unbundled RECs, you know, they may be RECs that were generated generally outside of my subregion or outside of my utility zone. So could I could be in Albany, New York and be buying RECs that were ultimately generated in Iowa or, or a blend, a mix that could be generated in Iowa or Texas. I'm not buying the electricity, I'm just buying those claims. And then similar to unbundled RECs, we have a virtual power purchase agreement. So instead of buying RECs on, on, on the REC market, I'm entering into an agreement with a specific generator, for example, in Iowa and saying, hey, I'm not going to buy your, your electricity because I'm, I'm not within your, your zone. I'm not near you, but I'm going to buy the RECs that you, that you generate. 
And so all of these contractual instruments are different levers that you can pull if you're looking to influence the market and influence your, your electricity emissions. I also want to note that there are a variety of different contractual instruments depending on what type of market you are, you're in and, and where you are in the world. This is just some of the most, the most common ones. But if you're, if you're trying to think about your electricity supply and whether you have a contractual instrument, just bring it back to this definition here. Okay. Am I buying from a specific supplier? If so, am I buying those energy attribute claims? And if I'm not buying from a specific supplier, am I just buying some, some form of renewable energy certificate? In our app, we simplify things even further by putting these contractual instruments into different buckets. And so I just have a table here just describing how we how we categorize these different instruments. It'll make more sense when when we get into the demo and and you see how we use these. And I do want to add a note, you know, this this last row here, if you have no contractual instruments, so you're just buying electricity from your utility, then that means that if you're in a deregulated market, your utility is actually procuring your electricity for you. And if you're in a regulated market, it's just directly from your utility. And, and we lump that all into grid electricity. And then lastly, I do want to cover some sources of non-grid electricity. So what we've talked about is buying electricity from the grid, which is the most likely case, but it is possible to get electricity from other sources. So the first one here, direct line microgrid would describe a case where there's a, a fossil fuel generator nearby nearby your, your location. Very often, you know, if you're located on a campus, this might be the case. And that electricity is being transferred directly to you. So it's not going into the, not going into the local grid. So that's direct line microgrid. And then obviously onsite renewables are, are always possible. So you can have solar on your roof, or you can be part of a community solar project that is, has a direct transmission line to you. In that case, you know, we do gather that information so we can understand your full picture of electricity consumption, but onsite renewables have no, I mean, they don't even have a zero emissions factor. They're not factored into your inventory because they're, they have no scope to impact. And then finally, I don't have it on this slide, but you can also have your own fossil fuel generation. So if you have a, a cogen plant or something like that, and in that case, we don't account for those emissions in scope two. They're accounted for in your scope one, you know, the fuel that you're combusting to, to create that electricity would fall under stationary combustion scope one. As we transition into the demo, I think what you're going to see is that, you know, we have a really simplified tool for collecting all this information, try to only show you what you need to need to know and need to tell us. So all you really need to know to use, to use our app is, you know, where am I getting my electricity from and in in what quantities. All these accounting rules and the different emission factors that are used for the two methods are handled within the app. They're all programmed into it. So, so you don't need to know how these are calculated. I think the most important part is just understanding, okay, what are these different contractual instruments? And then also, how do I interpret my the two outputs that I get, my location and market-based methods? And with that, I will hand it over to Jasmine. Thank you, Nick. I also just want to remind everyone that you can enter any questions that you have into the Q&A part of the Zoom platform, and we'll get to those at the end. I see some questions coming in already, so we'll address those after this. So I'm going to share my screen so that I can show you our platform. If you... Okay, so I'm going to take you through how our platform Sustain Life helps you input electricity data and then translate those over into the location and market based emissions that Nick was just going through. Um, so at a high level, Sustain Life helps you measure, manage and report your environmental impact, namely your carbon emissions. And so when you first land into our app, you'll land on this homepage that gives you a broad overview of your total emissions your total spend across a variety of different business activities. So buildings will include electricity, which will be going into today, but you can also track business activities like purchases, people, vehicles, and waste. So as Nick mentioned, you don't need to know the ins and outs of carbon accounting to use our platform. You need to understand what business activities you have, enter those into our platform, and we will translate those over into some of the standard terms around scope one, two, and three emissions, 
and then also a categories that align with the greenhouse gas protocol. So today we'll be zooming in on purchase electricity and going through how you can track and track that in the platform. So from here, you'll go into our buildings category. On our landing page, you'll be able to see everything that you've previously tracked with the emissions amount, as well as a high level overview of your total emissions, spend, and then break down by subcategory for the date and location that you've selected. So if you're coming in here for the first time and you know you wanna track your buildings data, the first thing that you'll do is configure your preferences across locations. And the reason you would do this is that you might have a different setup across different locations at your company. So for example, let's go into London. For electricity, you'll toggle this on because that's what you wanna track. There you have the option to select either without contractual instruments or with contractual instruments. Just show you what those look like. So if you don't have any contractual instruments, you would select this option and then say you just get one number off of your utility bill and it comes from the grid, from your utility provider, you can just set it up this way. If you do have contractual instruments, you would select this option. And then there's a variety of different contractual instruments that you can configure here. So for example, you might have these energy supply contracts, in which case you would enter the supplier name here. And then if you have a custom factor that comes from that energy supply contract, you can enter it here. And that way, if it's lower than the grid number, your market-based electricity will be lower. And if you don't have a custom factor, no worries. We can use the emissions factor from the grid. Uh, let's say in this case for my London location, I just have my grid electricity, which is selected by default, along with offsite renewables, which are 100% renewable. So I'll configure it this way. And then just to note, you can track other types of energy as well here. So for example, if you have natural gas coming in the same bill, but for the purposes of this demo, we'll focus in on electricity today. So you can then save those and you can set those different configurations across your locations so that the next time you come in, those preferences are already set up. Set up. So from here, there are a few ways of entering data into the platform. The first is manual entry, which will really be entering data month by month and location by location. It is pretty manual, so it's really just a good way to get started and start understanding what are the components of your electricity. But most people use our bulk import feature, which is a way of pre-aggregating all of your data offline and then inputting it into the system in one go via an Excel spreadsheet. And then lastly, we have integrations that are already preset with hundreds of different utility providers. This way you can just configure your setup one time and Sustain Life will handle the ongoing process of pulling those monthly invoices into the system and translating them into admissions. So I'll start with manual entry first, and this will give you a good idea of what's actually going on behind the scenes. So let's say I wanna start with my London location and I wanna start with this month's worth of data. You can go far back if you want. You can start with, let's say, data in 2018 and move forward and gather a baseline across multiple years. Or you can start with whatever the latest state range is, depending on what type of baseline you're looking to collect. So here for my London location, I had selected contractual instruments. And let's say I had 10,000 kilowatt hours of total grid electricity you'll see that the emissions number is immediately calculated. What this is doing in the back end is actually looking up your location and the best factor relevant to that location, whether it's your subregion within the US or in other countries, it could be at the region or province or country level. You'll see here if I enter offset renewables, so let's say 5,000 of those kilowatt hours came from offset renewables, those have an emissions factor of zero. And so that means your regular grid electricity now only is 5,000 kilowatt hours as well. The emissions amount will update in real time. So you'll see this actually got cut in half to reflect your decision to purchase offsite renewables. Um, one thing to note is that all of the numbers on this page reflect your market-based emissions, which is why it's reflecting the emissions factor of zero from your offsite renewables. For location-based emissions, you can go to your R reporting, which I will show you later to get both of those numbers. So a few other things to call out is you can track your spend data as well in here. And that just helps you track your costs over time and track against 
your total electricity budget. It doesn't factor into the emissions total, but it does help you get a sense of not only how your usage and emissions are changing over time, but also the costs that you're putting forth towards your electricity. The last thing to call out here is that you can attach documents. And so a great thing to attach here for reference would be the PDF of your utility bill for that month or supporting documentation from your energy supply contract that might say why you've put in a custom factor. All of those can be attached here. You can add some notes. And these will be really helpful later on for if you're either coming back to reference the data yourself or you're sharing it with a teammate or you're uh, bringing in an external auditor that's helping you verify your emissions data. So we'll make sure that all of your evidence is already attached by the time an auditor comes in. So from there, you'll save your data and then it will appear in your ledger below. Uh, so this is always a quick place you can go to reference uh, individual entries you've input in the past. You can always uh, edit or delete them. Uh, you can come in and add a, a additional documentation. Uh, and then I'll just quickly run through the bulk import feature as well. This is really a much easier way of entering your data. It will save you a lot of time. But if you've either collected all of your utility bills already, or you have them stored elsewhere in your company system, either in spreadsheets or in a different platform, this is an easy way of just translating that in one go. And so what you'll do is just select the date range that you want to apply. Uh, your configurations that you previously set will already be set up here. And then you can download the template and fill in the data and upload it here. And in that way, you've cut out many hours of manual work, which you would have done if you were doing it individually. And then the last way of inputting data that I'll go over is integrations. This is by far the easiest way of entering the data. It really removes all the manual intervention that's needed to gather and track your bills and really automates all of that for you. So Sustain Life has a variety of integrations built into the platform. So all you have to do is set up an integration for your locations. So you would set up one integration per utility provider, map the locations to the, the account numbers or the meters coming from your utility provider, and then from there, attach your utility provider credentials. That way, we'll be able to look for your data once a month and pull that data in automatically. What that looks like is within your company settings, you'll be able to see all of your integrations in one place. And so I'll just dive into one example that I've set up for my New York location. So my New York location uses a Con Ed utility provider. I've input my credentials just once and done that mapping one time, which you can always edit here. And then from there on, Sustain Life has pulled in all the historical data that's available from the provider, as well as going forward, we'll pull in those invoices once a month and then translate those over into emissions entries without needing any manual intervention. So this is what it will look like here. So we automatically pull in your electricity usage, your spend data, and translate that into emissions based on the emissions factor, either of your grid or the energy supply contracts that you've set up. And then we also attach the bill here so that you can easily reference it at any point. You can use it to check that this data is accurate or use it again for auditing purposes later on. But once you do the initial setup, this data will just come in uh, ongoing on an ongoing basis and free up your time to focus really on the next step, which I'll now go into. So let's say that you've now put in a year or two worth of electricity data and you want to understand what you can do with that data. That's where our reports come in, which you can navigate to from this part of the app. Um, these reports will really help you gain insights into your data to identify hotspots, anomalies, and then also you can use those numbers for any kind of sustainability reporting that you're putting together, either just for your internal team or for an external party. So I'll go into those reports next. So in Sustain Life's platform, we have a per category report built out. And this is really like an analytics dashboard that you can use to explore your data, gain some high level insights, and then also be able to zoom in on areas of priority and narrow in on a more detailed level. So at the highest level for buildings, you can see your energy usage over time, as well as what that's to in terms of emissions. And so in my case, that covers both electricity and the natural gas I was tracking for air stationary combustion. You'll also see your spend trends over time. So you can see how when your electricity usage is changing, how that is translating into differences in cost for you. And then we have some 
report specific to electricity. And so, as I mentioned, you'll be able to follow both methodologies for both market-based and location-based emissions, and they'll both be surfaced within this reporting. So at this high level, you'll get a bird's eye view of your total electricity, including your usage, your spend, and your emissions. And you'll also get a high-level overview of your renewable sources. So what percentage of your electricity is coming from renewable energy that's directly acquired? This is a good bird level, bird's eye view, level view, but you might want to dive into the details next. So from there, you can go into our electricity details tab. And just to note, you can always adjust the date ranges you're looking at and the locations that you're looking at, as well as the units of measure. But for this purpose, I'll show you all of the dates that I've been tracking against across all of my locations. So you'll see here that the location-based emissions and market-based emissions are tracked month over month. In this case, the location-based emissions are higher than the market-based ones because there are renewables that are not that have an emissions factor of zero under the market-based emissions methodology. But under the location-based emissions methodology, we're using the emissions factor from the grid. Uh, this is just another view of your electricity usage over months. You can always drill down into a specific month if you want to view the specific transactions. That can be helpful for if you see anomalies or spikes over time. And then lastly, you can dive into hotspots based on your locations. So for my example, London makes up the majority of both my electricity usage and my emissions. So I might then want to dive into there to see what is contributing to those and what I can do over time to prioritize this location and this category. So overall, you can use Sustain Life to not only make it really easy to gather all of your electricity data in one place, but also dive into reportable metrics around location and market-based emissions that you can use in reporting, as well as gain insights into areas of priority. So with that, I will move on to the Q&A, and I think we've had a few questions come in. Thanks, Jasmine. Yep, yeah, we've got a, got a lot of really good questions here. So just... Got time to go through a few of these. We have one here. Would community solar fall under energy supply contract? It, it depends on the arrangement of your, your community solar project. If that project is feeding electricity into the grid and then you are consuming electricity from the grid, then that's actually more akin to having a power purchase agreement, um, but it would fall under a contractual instrument. And then as I discussed during the presentation, if that community solar project is directly transmitting the electricity to you so it's not going through the grid then we would consider that on-site renewable and the difference between the two is that the former arrangement would result in a location location-based emissions and zero market-based emissions and the latter where they're directly transferring it to you would result in zero emissions under both both methods another question here as a household consumer i can select a percent of renewables for my utility what bucket would that fall into is that an energy supply contract yes that is and you can do that as a household consumer or you can do that as as a business another question here can you buy or buy a ppa in florida given the grid has a high emission factor unfortunately florida is a regulated electricity market which means the, you have no ability to exercise any of your consumer choice into where your electricity is coming from because the utility generates all the electricity and you get what you get. So with a PPA, you wouldn't be able to say, I want my electricity to be supplied from a specific generator because there's only one entity generating electricity. You can, however, still purchase RECs or still engage in a virtual PPA with a generator elsewhere in the US. And this kind of illustrates one of the downsides of regulated markets and the inability for electricity users to exercise any influence on the generation sources. Another question here, what's to keep a provider from overselling RECs? How is it guaranteed they won't oversell more than they produce? Is it illegal? Is it fraudulent? It would absolutely be illegal and fraudulent for, for a generator to oversell RECs or, or claim to produce more renewable electricity than they actually do. And I don't know the details of how it's regulated, but I know that that, that market is, it's highly monitored and something that uh, they keep an eye out for. So I think if you're buying RECs on the market, you can have full confidence that, that they actually represent some renewable electricity that was produced. Scott asks, I 
if I have a microgrid or behind the fence electric generation that is renewable, do I deduct that from scope two emissions? So basically describing an arrangement here where you have some on-site renewables and the way you would account for this is I assume that we're kind of in a, that you would have a net metering arrangement, which means that you would feed any excess electricity back into the grid. The way you would account for this is you would not deduct anything from your scope two emissions. You would simply look, look at your, how much electricity you imported from the grid. And that's what would be filed under, under grid electricity in our app. And then separately, you could also report your on-site generation under on-site renewable in our app. And that way we could give you a full picture of your electricity consumption. But essentially there's, you would use your gross electricity consumption, not your net. Okay, this is a great question here. When you're using grid emissions numbers, how do you account for changes in combination of genera generation operations into the grid? These changes can be hour to hour depending on weather and operational issues. Yeah, this is a great question because the emissions intensity of the grid actually changes minute to minute as different generation sources are, are dispatched to meet demand on the grid. Generally, when demand is high on the grid, the grid is dirtier because those dispatchable generation sources come from fossil fuels. And this is one area where the greenhouse gas protocol actually lags behind. There's no, according, following the, the accounting principles within the protocol, there's no factoring in of time of use for electricity consumption, even though that does have a real impact on your, they are, however, talking about creating a revision to incorporate this type of information into emissions accounting. But, but right now it's, it's not part of calculating an emissions inventory. Let's see here. Jasmine, we got a question about the utility integrations. Yeah, I saw a few around the utility integration, so I'll answer those. There was a question about how Sustain Life accesses my utility bills and how you extract that information to the application. So as I showed, you can set up an integration in the UI. It will take you through a series of steps where you authorize access using your utility provider credentials. In terms of how that works with us, we don't actually store any of those credentials ourselves. We work with third-party utility aggregators that are actually on our behalf going and getting that information directly from the utility providers via APIs. And then via APIs, we pull that data into our system, but we don't actually have access to your credentials. And then I think I saw a question about how the integration option is available on the current Sustain Life platform. So that needs to be turned on for your account because there is some manual onboarding required for us to understand your setup and your mappings. So if you do want to set that up, definitely reach out to your customer support representative and we can work through that process with you. Okay. Okay, I think those are the ones around the integrations. I think that's going to wrap up our webinar today. If you did have a question, we will respond to it over over email. So don't feel don't feel left out. But we appreciate you joining us today, and hope to see you in our app. Thank you, everyone.